Wait, 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 wait. This is performance, not principles of flight. Why am I gonna start teaching you the wrong subject? Well, let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the second class in the performance series. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at principles of flight, which yes, is the wrong subject. I know, but we basically have to have a basic understanding of some principles of flight before we move on to the more performance-based stuff. I've done a whole series in the past on principles of flight, so if you're ever looking for a bit more depth and detail on things I'm talking about, please go and check out those videos because this will be a quick run through of what we need for performance. Total pressure is equal to the static pressure in the air plus any dynamic pressure that's caused by air moving over an object. The static pressure is greater at lower levels and reduces as we increase in altitude and in the international standard atmosphere, this drop in pressure happens at a rate of one hectopascal every 27 or 30 feet. Um, 27 if you want to be exact, 30 feet if you want to be a bit more rough with it. In the real atmosphere, this relationship is not as linear, but the pressure lapse rate in ISA conditions is a good estimation. The dynamic pressure is generated when an object moves through the air or the air moves over an object. And the amount of pressure is dependent on the density and the speed of this air. The faster we go, then the more dynamic pressure we experience and the more dense the air, again, the more dynamic pressure we will experience. And the formula for dynamic pressure is a half rho v squared and it's normally given the symbol Q. Total pressure on a moving object at a fixed air density is always constant. So we can say that as one goes up, the other one must go down in terms of static and dynamic pressure to keep the value for total pressure constant. So if we travel fast through the air, increasing our dynamic pressure, then our static pressure would have to drop to maintain the total pressure constant. And this is actually how a wing works. It accelerates the air over the top surface, reducing the static pressure on the air when compared to the air below. And this difference in pressure generates a force, which we call lift. So lift, as we just saw, is generated from the pressure differential caused by the dynamic pressure. And it acts through something called the center of pressure, the C of P. This gives us a value for lift per unit area if we use the uh, dynamic pressure. So we need to multiply it by the area of the wing to find out how much lift the, this actual wing will produce. And there's also a third factor involved which is called the coefficient of lift. This is basically a measure of how good the wing is at making lift under certain conditions. The value of this coefficient will change according to the angle of the wing, the shape of the wing, whether we have flaps out or not. Um, basically for more in-depth detail, watch my video on lift in the Principles of Flight series. And yeah, try to ignore the background music. I was still experimenting with the videos back then. But lift equals a half rho v squared dynamic pressure times the surface area times the coefficient of lift. Weight is a force that pulls an object towards the surface of the earth or in our case, our plane towards the surface of the Earth. It is the mass of an object multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second, or 10 for rough calculations. Weight acts through the center of gravity, the C of G. And our plane needs to have the same amount of lift as it does weight in order to fly straight and level. The lift acting through the center of the pressure and the uh, weight acting through the center of gravity are rarely in the same position. The center of pressure and the center of gravity are normally uh, spaced out along the length of the aircraft with the center of gravity being further forward. This causes a slight rotation because the lift pulls us up from the back, weight pulls us down or from the uh, nose. We get a slight nose down pitching caused by this. And we get around this problem of this nose down pitching moment by using the tail of the aircraft to generate downforce. We do that in the same way as we generate lift, but we just invert that. And it's basically like an F1 car. It pushes down the back of the aircraft down 
and this stops the nose up pitching moment. Sorry, stops the nose down pitching moment by creating a nose up moment. Drag comes in two main forms. We get parasite and induced. Parasite drag comes from the shape of the aircraft frontal surfaces, the surface texture and any contamination that may be on the aircraft skin. And it is proportional to the aircraft speed squared. So in a diagram, it looks something like this. So basically at high speeds, it creates a lot of drag, which is why fast jets are all streamlined and smooth. Think of the very pointy nose of the Concorde. The value of the uh, amount of parasite drag can be given a coefficient, which we call the coefficient of drag parasitic. Induced drag is induced by the creation of lift. So when we create lift, basically the force that is created by the pressure differential doesn't come off straight up like this. It actually comes off at a bit of an angle like that. We can then break this resultant force down into two components. The, po the component that directly opposes the weight is called the lift, and there's a horizontal component like this, which is our induced drag. This induced drag is inversely proportional to the aircraft speed squared. So on a graph, it looks like this. And again, the amount for the value of induced drag can be given a little coefficient, which is CDI. So we've got the two elements of drag, parasitic and induced, and we can get a value for total drag if we just add um, the induced and the parasitic to get an overall coefficient of drag, which we then substitute in for this um, and calculate the drag using drag equals a half rho v squared s c d. But on a graph, the total drag looks something like this. It's a u-shaped curve for total drag. And on this u-shaped graph, there's some pretty interesting things. You can see here at the bottom of the u, we have the least amount of drag. And this only happens at one specific forward speed. This line at the bottom is speed, this is drag. This speed for minimum drag, we call VMD, V minimum drag. And if we fly faster than this, we get more drag. And if we fly slower than this, we also get more drag. And on the right side of this graph, we are in the speed stable region, or not on this graph necessarily, but on this line on the graph. We're in a region which is called the speed stable region. And basically, if we pick a speed here and we maintain a constant thrust set then if we speed up for some external reason, such as a gust of wind, then the drag will increase. And if we don't change the thrust setting, that drag will slow us back down towards this speed. Similar things happens if we slow down. If we slow down, our drag reduces. We have the same amount of thrust set. That thrust can be used to speed us back up towards this speed. On the other side of the uh, curve, or the back of the drag curve, this is sometimes called, it's the opposite case. Say we pick a speed here. If we have a set thrust and then we slow down, the drag increases and we would slow down even more unless we were to change the thrust setting. If we speed up, then the drag reduces and we'd start to speed up unless we brought the thrust back a little bit. So that side of the graph is called speed unstable because it wants to diverge from the speed and this would be the speed stable side because it wants to uh, come back to that original starting speed. Again, there's a lot more information on my drag video and total drag video in the Principles of Flight series. Thrust is needed basically to overcome the drag of the plane. Performance revolves a lot around how much thrust is needed for certain phases of flight and what factors to take in to effect. So it's kind of worth giving a, vi a whole video to. Um, but for now, just know that thrust has to equal drag for us to be at level flight, and lift has to equal weight for us to be steady level flight as well. There are many different speeds in aviation, so we need to understand the differences. First of all, we measure speed using some device which measures dynamic pressure. And the way to do this is we basically measure the total pressure using a pitot tube, and then we get the static pressure from a static port, 
and then as total pressure is equal to the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure, we can figure out a value for the dynamic pressure. We would have a value for density and be able to work out the speed. The speed that we are showing on our dials or our screen would be called our indicated airspeed, our IAS. This IAS has some errors in it caused by the instrumentation itself, basically, because the pitot tubes and the static ports can't be manufactured perfectly. So there's going to be some errors. If we know the accuracy, accuracy levels of the instruments and the accuracy they've been calibrated to, then we can apply a correction to the IAS to get a calibrated airspeed, a CAS. In most cases, this will be a very small difference. And in a computer-based system, this error can be removed before it even gets to the display. So the indicated airspeed roughly equals the calibrated airspeed. If we take our calibrated airspeed and then correct that by the effects of compressibility, then we get an EAS, an equivalent airspeed. What is compressibility though? Well, compressibility happens when high speed flowing into the pitot tube compresses, and this artificially raises the value for our density. So our value for total pressure becomes a bit warped, and we can't really get an accurate measure of dynamic pressure. If we know the compressibility error at high speeds, then we can correct it, and we arrive at a speed which is pretty close to our speed through the air, our true airspeed, but it's called our equivalent airspeed. Because calibration errors are usually quite small or already corrected for us, and the compressibility effects only really happen at high speeds, we can make a rough assumption that the indicated airspeed equals the calibrated airspeed, which also equals the equivalent airspeed if we're at slow speed. So to get our true airspeed, we need to take our equivalent airspeed and correct it for the density error. The density error is the difference in density between the altitude we're flying at and mean sea level in ISA conditions. And it can be often be seen in this sort of equation. The equivalent airspeed is equal to the true airspeed multiplied by the square root of the density of the altitude we're flying at versus the density mean sea level ISA conditions. So if we change our altitude higher and give a random value for density, so um, let's go 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed over 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, then we can see we're going to make our true airspeed, uh, sorry, our equivalent airspeed is gonna be a lot uh, less than our true airspeed. True airspeed is important for calculating the forces on planes, such as lift and drag, if we want to be highly accurate, but when flying around, the most common thing to use is indicated airspeed because that's what we have in front of us. And that's the speed that we use up until we're above a certain altitude, um, or above a certain speed, at which point we switch over to Mach numbers. So the Mach number is the ratio of the true airspeed to the local speed of sound, and the local speed of sound is given as 39 times the square root of the temperature in Kelvin, and Kelvin is the Celsius temperature plus 273. This means that if we climb or descend with a constant value for Mach number, then as we get into warmer or colder air, we see that the true airspeed must change in order to keep the Mach number constant. For example, if we climb and we get into colder air, then the value for local speed of sound goes down. That means that our true airspeed would also have to go down in order to make this equation work and keep the Mach number constant. If we descend into warmer air, then the task has to increase as the local speed of sound increases as well. To summarize then, Total pressure equals static pressure plus dynamic pressure. If dynamic pressure goes up, then static pressure has to go down, and that's how we generate lift. We use a pressure differential on the, uh, between the fast flowing air on the top of the aircraft and the slower moving air on the bottom of the aircraft to generate a force. We multiply the dynamic pressure by the surface area of the wing at a coefficient of lift to get a value in newtons for lift, an actual force value for lift, and the coefficient of lift will change according to various things, such as the design, flaps, or the angle of the wing to the relative airflow. Weight acts towards the center of the earth, and it acts through the center of gravity, whereas lift acts through the center of pressure. Because the center of gravity is normally a little bit ahead of the center of pressure, this creates a slight nose down pitching moment, and we balance that out by creating downforce in the tail 
which creates a nose up pitching moment and it balances itself out. Drag comes in two forms. We get parasite drag, which increases according to the speed squared caused by the design, the shape of the frontal surfaces, the texture of the skin the, the, and the contamination on the skin. We also get induced drag, which is induced by lift because in reality, the force that is generated from the wing doesn't come off straight up like that. It comes off at a slight angle. We get one component, which is the lift, and the other component, which is the induced drag. Total drag is a combination of parasite and induced drag, and it gives this U-shaped curve here. At the bottom of the curve, we get our speed for lowest drag, V minimum drag. And to the right, we're in the speed stable region. And to the left, or the back of the drag curve, we're in the speed unstable region. For now, all you need to know is for level flight, thrust equals drag lift equals weight, but in reality, lift has to equal weight plus downforce. To calculate our speed through the air, we basically need to find a value for total pressure, find a value for static pressure, and we can find a value for dynamic pressure. We know the density, we can find out the speed, and that will give us our indicated airspeed. If we have any instrumentation errors caused by the actual manufacturing of the instrument itself, we can apply them to get a calibrated airspeed. Then if we apply compressibility errors caused by um, the air compressing into the pitot tube and artificially raising the density at high speeds, then if we correct for them, we get the equivalent airspeed. The equivalent airspeed can then be corrected for any density errors to get the true airspeed. And the density error is basically because air is less dense at altitude when compared uh, to sea level. And you can often see EAS, equivalent airspeed, equal to true airspeed times the square root of density the altitude we're at versus over density at mean sea level. So as we go higher, the equivalent airspeed is actually going to be uh, lower than the true airspeed. And we use normally when we're flying around the indicated airspeed because that's what we've got in front of us until reaching certain altitudes and speeds, at which case we switch over to the Mach number, which is the ratio of the true airspeed over the local speed of sound. And the local speed of sound is 39 times the square root of the temperature in Kelvin.